series which were entitled Questions that Jesus Asked. Questions that Jesus Asked. And the first one, um, we quite easily can apply to ourselves here today. And it's quite a simple question taken from Matthew, which says, what do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? You may notice on the tables there's bits of paper, and on the bit of paper you can answer that question if you want. Jesus is saying this morning, what do you want me to do for you? Now, nobody else needs to see your answer. Um, you can take it home, put it in your purse, put it in your bag, whatever it might be, hide it away somewhere. Um, but it's a good idea to keep it, because I'm quite convinced that there's going to be a point where Jesus will answer that prayer or that request. Um, and again, for the guys online, if you've got a bit of paper hand in a pen, then you can answer that as well. What do you want me to do for you? We read in Matthew chapter 20, we're just going to read a few verses from Matthew, beginning at verse 29. <clears throat> and it says here, And as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. Of course, that was Jesus. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked him, telling him to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, What do you want me to do for you? What do you want me to do for you? We're going to look at this from three different aspects this morning. First of all, obviously they had physical healing, then they had spiritual healing, and then we'll see lastly how they followed Jesus. You know, it's great to ask questions. And um, even when you're reading the scriptures, just keep you asking yourself questions. Questions like, who is that speaking to? What is the setting? What's the context? And so the list can go on. How can that apply to me in my situation? And you all find answers. The only way that we really learn, to be honest with you, the only way that we really learn is simply by asking questions. But when I read this section, I really did find that interesting. In fact, in one sense, we could say it was a bit bamboozling. Because if we can picture the scene, Jesus is there, two men obviously blind, they would have been begging at the side of the road, and they would have obviously been blind, and not only that, to amplify that, and um, to draw attention to it, the whole crowd that was there told them to be silent, told them to be silent. And yet Jesus asked me, asked him, what do you want me to do for you? I don't know about you. I think it was pretty obvious what they wanted, they wanted Jesus to do. Because they were blind. So really, it doesn't take a rocket science, a rocket scientist to figure out when they're blind, so they want to see. Simple. So why did Jesus not just go up to them and lay hands on them and actually they would have received 
that say Jesus must have known at this point that these men were blind. And especially if we think about different passages, passages in light to Jeremiah, where it says, For I know the plans I have for you, plans to prosper, etc., etc. So Jesus knows the plan for these men for their life. And yet, they still ask him, he still asks them, what is it you want me to do? You know, I often think that what we need to do is verbalize. In other words, speak out what we want Jesus to do. And we see that time and time again in Scripture, so we do. And it might be, you may feel a wee bit dark um, about this, but the things that you've written on that bit of paper may even be a, 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 a good idea when you go home in your own quiet time just to speak them out and just literally verbalize what you have written. And if you can manage that, I'm sure you'll be blessed by it. Because if we think about what it says in Scripture, it says, if you confess with your mouth, confess, that gives you the idea to verbalize it, that you need to be, have your sins forgiven, that you need to repent. And then we can go to passages like other passages in this book, where it says, ask and it shall be given. So again, that's the idea of vocalizing something. And I really do believe that sometimes we may just stay in our head. In a room quite time, Lord, can you just do this? But actually, I think it's got more power if we actually verbalize what it is we want. And we see this here because the three men had to actually reply what it was that they wanted Jesus to do. And of course, we're doing this. Then, <coughs> then they were healed. If you like, Jesus wanted them to declare their faith boldly. I don't know if you might come on to this later on, but just in case you don't, it's just come into my mind. Um, but time and time again we see in Scripture that it says your faith has made you whole. Now, I believe there's a misconception. Sometimes it goes round in regards to that. And unfortunately, some people would say that it's the amount of faith that you've got that makes you whole. I think that's a wrong, a, a, a wrong idea, a wrong teaching. And if I had to say here this morning that or you have to come to me and say, Lord, I've been praying for donkeys to be healed or for us to be answered, but it never seems to happen. And if my response is to be where we need more faith, then what that is actually doing is it's heaping more guilt on a person. It's heaping more guilt on a, a person bad, feels bad enough as it is without me adding more stuff on them. So I don't think it's about the level of faith or how much faith you've got. I don't get that at all. Because God would never heap guilt on somebody else. Never. They'd never do that. So if it's not about how much faith or the level of faith that you've got, then what is it? It means simply because of your faith. Because you've got faith, then that's going to make a difference. And it will make a difference. We know it, we saw it, and we've experienced it. Somebody who hasn't got faith will never be healed. 
Some of you have never got faith, will never see God answer them because you don't believe. But somebody who does have faith, then that makes all the odds. And in actual fact, I think it goes further than that. Because we have got faith, then we can pray for somebody else who might not have faith. And I think that's important. If you like, we can intercede for that person. <clears throat> I'm just going to quickly speak on this wee bit um, in regards to physical healing. We've spoken about this before. But there is no doubt that in this story that we do see a physical healing. And I think actually for me, when we look at that, then we see the compassion of Jesus. Jesus, if you like, had a really, really busy schedule. He was on the march with a group of folk, and it says that there was a crowd of folk round about him, and yet he took the time to stop and listen to what these men had to say. So in this, we actually see the compassion that Jesus had. And Jesus is that that compassion for everyone. Here today, people in the world today, people in the world of that time. It's interesting, if you like, those who were on the boat, Jesus tried to push these men away. How sad is that? Sometimes the world will try to push us away from Jesus. But Jesus will never do that. Jesus will take time for us. We see the urgency in this as well. Um, no one once did the men cry out, but they kept, kept crying out. And they may have thought, you know what, this is my only chance. I ain't going to get another chance here. Jesus is passing, so I can make sure he hears us. Paul, who, the Apostle Paul, who was preaching in Mars Hill, um, he's preaching to those um, hearers, and he said, when will you hear again? Don't miss this opportunity. And I suppose in one sense we could say this so it's the same. And um, whether online or whether here in person, don't miss the opportunity. Don't miss that opportunity for God to work in your life. Barclay, a, 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 a big biblical scholar, says about these men's faith, what faith which I think is good. He says these two blind men had an imperfect faith, but they were determined to act on the faith they had. It was a son, as the son of David, they addressed Jesus. That meant that they did believe him to be the Messiah, but it also meant that they were thinking of the Messiahship in terms of kingly and therefore power. And it was this right here. It was an imperfect faith, but they acted on it, and Jesus accepted it. These men possibly had an imperfect faith. But that didn't hinder them. They acted on that imperfect faith, and Jesus accepted it. I don't know about you, but my faith is imperfect. I am still got a lot to learn. But I come to Jesus with that imperfect faith. And the beauty of that is that Jesus accepts it. The Apostle Paul, he says that he's striving towards the end. He's running that race. He's not finished the race yet. He's not perfect yet. But he's striving 
towards it. In other words, even the Apostle Paul, he believed that he thought that he had an imperfect faith. It wasn't complete. But God works with those who have got an imperfect faith. And then we come to our second point, and um, we've briefly looked at physical healing, but they weren't only physically healed, they were spiritually healed. And as I say, he wanted them to declare their faith boldly in response to this, he healed them. Time and time again, if you look at scriptures, people who were healed were also saved. Time and time again. Like the person where Jesus says, go away and sin no more. Time and time and time again. You see, Jesus and the Holy Spirit has got a holistic, um, a holistic ministry. In other words, he takes care of the whole body. Not just one section of it, but he takes care of the whole of the body, mind, body, and soul, mind, body, and spirit. And we are going to be able to look at three points. First of all, the hair, then the saw, and then we'll look at the last point, the follow. Again, if you try and picture the scene, because these two men are these two men are sitting there, and the must have been the buzz, bustling noise, the business of that crowd that was walking past. But they must have realized that there was actually something different, there was something important that was coming, or someone important that was coming. They heard, <coughs> they heard that Jesus was passing. Why? Isn't it wonderful? Do we realize that Jesus is here, his spirit is here? He wants to touch every single one of us, whether online or whether here this morning. If you like, every Sunday morning in Forgotten, Jesus is in Forgotten. The Spirit is in Forgotten. We just need to pray that people will listen and hear. They'll hear that Jesus is actually here and that He can do some amazing things. Sometimes that voice may be faint. Sometimes we think that that voice may be far off. But it's always there. It's always calling our name. It's always calling our name. It tells us in Matthew that he's like a wise man, the person that listens to this uh, this call of Jesus is like a wise man who built his house on a rock with a solid foundation. And why is that? Because they heard and they acted on it. They heard and they acted, acted on it. You know, we need to always have our ears tuned in to God. We always need to be listening to what he's got to say to us. <coughs> so they heard. And because they heard, because they acted on it, the result of this is that they saw. Both physically and spiritually. If you like, the scales were off their eyes. There's a group that I've had the privilege of hearing more than once. Um, I heard them once in the banks, by the banks of Owen, and I heard them again in Glasgow. 
and it's a group hot house flowers. Um, and hot house flowers sing this song. I can see clearly now. The rain has gone. I can see no obstacles in my way. Going on the dark clouds, I hardly blind. It's going to be a bright, bright sunshine day. That's what happened to these guys. The darkness had gone. They had been in darkness for so many years. But they saw the beauty for the first time that surrounded them. Can you imagine that? Can you imagine being in a place where, a place of darkness where they couldn't see, and then all of a sudden they could see the beauty and the wonder of God's creation? You know, when we, when we become Christians, again God opens our eyes. And we can see things a lot more clearly than we've ever seen before. If you like, the darkness of the blindness is gone. And in actual fact, we don't see totally clear even yet. Because I think it's in the book of Romans that it says we see as if we're in a mirror glass or a looking glass. And in that day and age, a mirror glass or a looking glass, a mirror, was misshapen. So when somebody looked at their reflection in a mirror, it wasn't like what we would see in a mirror, but because it had been beaten by a hammer or whatever, it was misshapen. It was totally clear. So they didn't even see Jesus totally clearly as they could. One day they will. And we are the same. Yes, to see Jesus in all his glory. Yes, the scales are falling from our eyes. But one day we'll even see clearer than what we do just now. I don't know if you've ever needed to go and get your eyes tested. Um, I have. Yep. And it's the best experience ever. Look at that. Because the day all this stuff stick this one, stick that one, stick another lens in and try another lens and so it goes on. But before you go, things are a wee bit hazy. And then when you come out with your new specs, you think, oh, it's bright, I can see. You know, that's what Jesus does for us, spiritually and physically. He makes everything a lot clearer. And I've often wondered, I don't know if you have, but I've often wondered, what would it be like when we get to heaven and we see Jesus face to face? What a day that's going to be. And I suppose in the book of Revelation, John does give us a kind of cryptic description of what Jesus what Christ is like. Because the first thing is that he says he's like a lampstand, which is the central stem, 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 that holds everything together. And Jesus is there holding absolutely everything together. He refers to him, or that refers to him, um, as the glue, if you like, that's holding everything. And then it says that he's got a robe, he's clothed in a priestly robe. And again we see that reference to the great high priest. So we're beginning to build up a picture. And then he's got a golden sash on as well in the book of Revelation. And then it describes his hair as being white, like wool and snow. And I don't think that's just referring to the colour, but I think that's referring more to the purity of Christ. And then it goes on to speak about the brightness and the glory of Christ as well. So bright that people had to hide 
their face from him. His eyes, a signal built as being like a flame of fire. And this evokes the image of a gaze which instantly pierces the deepest darkness to lay bare all of our sin. <coughs> and at the end of that description, it says his mouth is like a two-edged sword. And again, when we think about that, not only is he speaking the truth, but he's piercing our very souls. So we see Jesus, and it really will be a glorious day when we see him face to face. But just to finish up, and I'm not going to go through all of this, we may just highlight some of it. But not only did they hear, not only did they see, but the result of that was that they fall. They followed Jesus wherever they went. <coughs> you know, once we were healed, it would be pretty rude to walk away and ignore it. Sadly, there are some, some that I know of, who spiritually and physically have been healed, and yet have walked away. And that must cut to the core of God himself. To see a child that has been born again turn their back on him. But these men didn't do that. They got up and they followed Christ. And again, I was thinking to myself, what would it be like or what would it be to follow Jesus? Well, if we're going to look at chapter 4, and again if we read from verses 18 to 19, which is actually taken from the book of Isaiah, then it tells us what Jesus' ministry is like. And if we think about Jesus' ministry, then we get a picture of what it is, or what it looks like, or what it means to follow Jesus. And here it is. Uh, Luke 4, 18 and 19. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captives, and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. <coughs> What does it look like to follow Jesus? There it is, there. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me to proclaim the good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim liberty to the captive, recovering the sight of the blind, to set a liberty to those who are oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. First of all, it says there that the Spirit of God was upon him. Again, if we look at the beginning of John, if we look at the beginning of Luke, we'll see how many times it mentions the fact that the Spirit of the Lord was on, either John the Baptist or the Lord himself. How he had the power of the Holy Spirit, how he was upheld by the Holy Spirit again, time and time again. And of course, when we get saved, when we receive salvation, then the Spirit is imputed in us. The Spirit of God is actually within us. We receive His Holy Spirit. But in actual fact, we need to realize that not only was it the source of Jesus' ministry, <coughs> but it can be the source of our ministry as well. If you like, it can be the source, it was the source of Jesus' power, and it can be the source of our power as well. And we see that he was filled with the Spirit. 
and Ephesians 5 and 18. It says this, that we shouldn't get drunk with wine, but we should be filled by the Spirit. So really this is the stuff. We need to be, if you like, baptized, we need to be anointed, we need to be filled again with that Spirit. And then we see what are the five aspects of his ministry. And the first one, as we've said, he preaches good news to the poor. <coughs> actual fact, if we're going to the King James Version, I think it is, of the Bible, then the King James Version adds a bit onto that. Because it says not only that he uh, preaches good news to the poor, but he heals the broken happy as well. And then he says to captives free, and then he heals the blind. <coughs> then he says the oppressed free. You know, when we think about that word poor, <coughs> it can cover so many different areas. First of all, it can mean financial poverty. And the good news is, Jesus is asking us this morning, what can I do for me? But it's not only financial poverty, because it's spiritual poverty as well. And as a church, what hope we've got? People nowadays in the situation that we find ourselves, ourselves in, people are struggling financially. People are struggling spiritually, and the poor in spirit as well. They're confused with many different things that's going on. And we've got the hope, if you like, we've got the good news. And the good news is that Jesus can help. He helped these men, these blind men. He can help us in whatever situation we find ourselves in as well. The broken hearted, again, we saw it here, compassion on these men. <clears throat> and he has compassion for those who are struggling. We sing that song sometimes <coughs> graves and the gardens. And there's an amazing line in that every time I hear it, I just think it's amazing. Because it says that he comes more than into dancing. He turns more men into dancing. The reason is, <coughs> the reason is that we have got hope. The reason is that morning day has not the end. It's really just the beginning. But then he says to chapter 3, and I'm going to finish up before my voice totally not to disappear to you. But it says the captive free. Charles Wesley penned, <coughs> penned these words to an amazing hymn. And the hymn has over a thousand tongues to sing. The verse says this He breaks the power of cancelled sin, He sets the prisoner free. His blood can make the foulest queen. His blood, his blood avails for me. If we're in spiritual bondage, then praise God, he can free us from that. And he has done in many a case. We've just looked at the story of the blind men. And again, he heals the blindness, not only physical blindness, but spiritual blindness. And then lastly, he says to oppress free. 
That's one of prayer's means to let go or send away, set apart and be free. Isn't it amazing that someone who is a prayer can be sent away, can be free from that oppression? Their circumstances can change. Those who have been downtrodden are overwhelmed with trouble. God brings peace. We may have been broken by calamity, crushed by the circumstances of life, to the point where we see no escape. And yet Jesus gives a way to escape. He has a freedom. He sends them out to green pastures. We go back. <coughs> we go back to the beginning, where we ask that question: What do you want Jesus to do for you today? Only you can answer that. God knows your heart. God does know what you need, but also God knows what you want. But like the blind man, I do believe that he is sitting there waiting for you to bear the light. And these men say, I want to see again. I want my blind, my blind, my sight to be restored. I wonder what it is that you want, whether here in person or online. What is it you want Jesus to do for you? We're going to sign our final 